Cool. So welcome, everybody. Uh, before things, I before I kick things off, it's usually good just to get a sense of things. Uh, who here has heard of Bitly in some way, society, shape, or form? Awesome. Basically, everyone in the room. Uh, who here has any clue of what we do beyond short links? Like how do we make money or, okay, so the guy who literally works there and <laughs> one other person. Great. Cool. Thank you. Uh, cool. So before I get into things, let me answer a little bit of that, right? So usually I talk to people. Well, quick context. My name is Sean O'Connor. Uh, I'm the lead application engineer at Bitly. I run the backend development team. Um, so I'll talk to people and I'll say, hey, I work at Bitly. Like, awesome, cool. Uh, so short links, uh, how's that like a thing, right? Like I can, I can literally write a URL shortener before you're done giving this talk. Like that's child's play, what, what's going on? And even if I accept doing that on a large scale and in a highly available way is a non-trivial problem, how do you actually make money? Like nobody's gonna pay just for short links. Um, part of the answer is actually some people will. Uh, we have a branding and analytics product, uh, so we host Several thousand custom short domains for all kinds of brands, as you've heard of ESPN, New York Times, Pepsi, so on. Um, but additionally, and more interestingly to this crowd, um, we provide analytics. So uh, I'll get into some of the numbers, but we see a whole lot of traffic of basically people clicking on stuff that's been shared on the web. And based on that, we can help our customers understand both the effectiveness of the things that they're sharing as well as what their audience is interested in across the web. So to that end, a little bit of scope. So every day, and actually these are probably slightly outdated, it's still close enough, we do about 230 million redirects. That works out to about 8 billion a month. Um, we do about 20 million shortens. I uh, forget what that works out to a month. Anyway, I think it's actually based on an order down, so like 800,000 or something like that. No, 8 million, excuse me. Yeah, anyway. Enough. <laughs> uh, we crawl about 4 million pages on the web to kind of learn things about the links that we're seeing. Uh, we do that with about 400 servers spread across two data centers with about 20 engineers doing 20 plus deploys a day. Uh, so lots of moving parts doing lots of things, which is fun, uh, which then leads to a lot of data. Then we have to figure out how to work with that, right? And the answer for us is distributed systems, right? Uh, Bitly, we love distributed systems. Uh, but what on earth do I mean by that? That seems like a crazy nonsense word. Um, so let's get into that. Uh, so this is grabbed off of the all-knowing and always correct Wikipedia, but I think it's actually originally sourced from a uh, distributed system textbook, so hopefully it'll be reasonable. Generally, it makes sense, right? So if we look at this definition of a distributed system, Distributed system is a software system in which components located on network networked computers communicate and coordinate their actions by passing messages, right? So we're, we're all trying to work towards a common goal, but we're not necessarily all in the same place. So we need to pass messages around. Cool. The components interact with each other in order to achieve a common goal, right? So that means that you know we're not all just moving in the same direction, but doing so completely independently, right? We have to have some interaction with each other. And there are three significant characteristics of distributed systems, right? Concurrency of components, lack of a global clock, and independent failure of components, right? Uh, so we'll get into each of these a bit more as far as what they mean and what implications they have, but these are things that are intrinsic to any distributed system and things that both uh, can be of a benefit, but that you also have to deal with. So get into that. So, uh, why are we, oh, actually sorry, real quick. Uh, I forgot my presenter notes. Right, there we go. So why do we want, why do we want to deal with this, right? It's starting to sound pretty complicated. It's starting to sound kind of confusing. Uh, why, why do we want this, right? And the answer at the end of the day is that knowledge is power, right? So by understanding these intrinsic properties of distributed systems and the techniques of dealing with that, we can build better tools. Uh, in particular, we can build systems that are faster, easier to scale, and more robust than they would be if we tried to design something that either tried to hide or ignore these intrinsic properties of distributed systems. Oh, and we do so for lower cost. So for context, let's look at a little bit of history, right? Uh, in the beginning, <laughs> uh, there were a variety, there was an earlier generation of uh, distributed systems um, 
But what they did is they built all kinds of crazy abstractions to hide the details of what's going on and basically make you s the, make the interface that you see as a developer be just a magic, magic infinite, perfect computer, right? Um, God, man, I am failing with this remote today. Cool, right? So an example of this is these things called NetApps. Uh, I don't know how many of you ever dealt with these. Uh, these are awesome machines in that, uh, basically, if you have all the money, you can have an infinite, perfect disk that doesn't lose data, that has no necessary performance bottlenecks, that has infinite space, right? Infinite being the m amount in your bank account. <laughs> uh, as suggested, these are very expensive. Um, and they're kind of limiting, right? So uh, the part of why these systems were built this way is for the most part, they were used to extend the life of existing systems, right? So there was, let's say, let's uh, some banking or insurance application that was written in, let's go with the 70s, uh, that more or less works just fine, but was rated originally designed for a few thousand customers. And now it has to deal with a few million or tens of millions of customers. Uh, and as that system was originally designed, it really kind of maybe relied on everything being on one disk for its like, consistency purposes or whatever. Um, so having that option of this magic infinite scaling disk is awesome. But since it has to have all the same constraints and characteristics uh, of that normal, actual, single spinning platter, um, it ha it's really constrained the design decisions that the uh, engineers building that system have to make. Part of that, that's part of why it's so expensive, right, is they've had to do some really crazy stuff to make what under the covers is a distributed system work like a single computer. Um, but additionally, there's lots of different trade-offs of just like, effectively awful things they have to do to hide what's going on. Um, so that, that was kind of the norm for a while. And then kind of around the time of the original dot-com boom, a little bit after, right? And obviously, this is a somewhat revised version of history, right? If you get into it, there's lots more new ones going on here. But uh, going along with my story, uh, you start seeing some newer style systems. Uh, some of the bigger examples and earlier examples of this were Google and Facebook, right? Uh, is how Bitly services look internally, right? So this is an example of some of the early Google servers, right? These are not the pretty NetApp, uh, you know, perfect wall of shiny lights, right? It's kind of gross, uh, and everything's kind of exposed. Um, but it's actually kind of a metaphor for how they started building their systems, right? So instead of having these perfect magic infinite scaling disks, you had stuff like MapReduce and whatnot that started to, uh, was, it was a big jump to try and start working with and uh, seemed kind of really weird and obtuse as far as why it would work this way. But it ended up giving them a ton of power in that they were now, their, the characteristics of their abstractions and their tools were in line with the underlying characteristics of the system they were building. And in return for kind of taking on that initial difficulty or grossness, right? They were able to build much more flexible cost and cost-effective systems, right? Uh, if you try to build PageRank, right, or like the original Google crawler, if they tried to build that on top of Oracle at the time, I'm sure they could have. I'm also sure they probably would have needed 10x of the amount of money that they had at the time, right? Um, sorry, did the mic just cut out? Can everybody still hear me okay? It does sound like the mic. Yeah. All right, so it might be scoring on the video. I apologize. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so let's just see real quick. Yep, no idea. Anyway, uh, so what about this makes this hard, right? So if this all lets us move fast and be cheap and have nice, flexible things, why don't we just do it, right? And it gets back to those uh, fundamental characteristics that I was talking about. Those are both where the power and the, the challenge come from. So the first one of those was concurrency of components, right? The power that you get from here is that's what allows you to scale, right? By having concurrency of components, it's what lets you scale it horizontally, right? It lets you have a dozen cheap boxes instead of one giant ass box that's going to cost you a fortune, right? Um, the gotcha here, though, is it makes coordination really hard, right? So now you have physically distinct computers 
that have their own, like are entirely separate systems. So there is no longer shared state for the system, right? You now have to have some coordination mechanism going on if those boxes care about what each other is doing, which gets interesting. And part of why that gets interesting is there's no longer a global clock, right? So if you think about how clocks and computers work, right, there's usually some kind of crystal, probably quartz, right, that has current running through it, and it vibrates at a fairly predictable rate. Um, and we just count the number of vibrations, and voila, we have time. Uh, but as you get into the details of things and deal with the horrible, messy real world, um, there's going to be slight variations there, right? Like there'll be some quirk in the, the quartz in one clock versus another, or a slight change in the, the voltage running across it. Uh, and since it's keeping track of time in this additive way, even if it's off by like a fraction of a microsecond, over the course of days or weeks or months or years, clocks will drift, right? So now when you're not all working off the same physical clock, uh, certain types of problems become difficult, right? So if you have to do strong ordering across physically distinct si computers, that becomes a really interesting problem. There's tools to manage the synchronization, but it gets tricky. Um, so again, yeah, that's another up challenge. Really, this one's just a challenge. Like it's once you have more than one computer, this is a thing you have to deal with. Uh, and then independent failure of components, right? So this gets to kind of more the availability side of things. Uh, if you have a truly distributed system, ideally the different components that work together but don't necessarily depend on each other should be able to have one fail and have the other keep on going, right? Because otherwise, you're just not, like you're, uh, on one hand, you're just not getting a whole lot of value. And once you get to a certain scale, there will always be failed components, right? But, I mean, so we're at Bitly at a certain scale with 400 servers, 200 of those are in EC2. Uh, several times a week, we have instances getting decommissioned or blipping out of existence in EC2, right? And that's not even that big, right? Like you get to a Google or a Facebook scale where you have data centers and data centers, and at any given moment, you probably have a few dozen servers that are just dead, right? Uh, so you have to be able to deal with that. So how do we actually go about doing this, right? Um, these sound like some kind of sticky problems uh, and things that, you know, it's not like you're just gonna push a button and have it done. Uh, how, do we, how do we go about it? Uh, the first and easiest answer is uh, if you don't need to worry about it, don't. <laughs> if you can get away with not building a distributed system for some value of a distributed system, do that, right? Like if you're just building, uh, you know, let's say uh, an app that's basically a form that feeds into a database and, gener and renders a list, right, like that, that has value, right? There's lots of things that humans do, right? Like you could just replace a couple million people's jobs with apps like that, right? Um, but you don't need a distributed system for that, right? Like at max, you're gonna have maybe a few hundred megs of data, right? Like a single box with a database can handle that. That's not a problem. Uh, so if you can avoid these problems, great. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in certain businesses, let's say like analytics, uh, where somewhat intrinsic to the way the business works, you are going to have unfortunate amounts of data. Uh, you're probably going to have to start dealing with some of these problems. So let's get into how do we actually deal with it. Uh, one of the biggest ways we deal with it from a design perspective at Bitly is service-oriented architecture, right? So what does that mean? That means that for us, there is no one big Bitly application. There are dozens of tiny services that communicate to each other over HTTP and queues. Um, and what this does is it gives us a, a ton of benefits, right? Uh, one of the biggest benefits is it makes everything easier to understand, both from a development standpoint and an operational standpoint, right? Uh, so, I mean, I've been at Bitly for about two years now. There are still non-trivial portions of our systems that I'm not intimately familiar with, just because Bitly's been around for about six years and people building stuff for six years produce a lot of stuff. Um, but that's okay, right? Because each thing that we have running internally, with one or two exceptions, is maybe a few hundred lines of code. So if for whatever reason, either I'm looking to fix something that's broken or add a new feature, I need to touch a system that I haven't touched before, it's okay because it's so small and focused that I can just look at it for a little bit and completely understand what's going on. Uh, similarly, when something breaks, right? I'm also in our on-call rotation. Something breaks at 4 a.m. 
it's very easy to see, OK, this service is what's having a problem. Now I only have to worry about what's going on inside that service, and I don't have to care about the rest of our system, right? Uh, which is incredibly powerful, especially as you build out in code complexity. Um, to that end, right, so you design, you kind of have like a Unix kind of philosophy. When we're doing it well, we design it so that any one service just does one thing well, right? This helps keep the code simple inside that service, and similar to the operational side, it keeps it so that that one service um, is easy to understand, and easy to predict, and fits into the overall architecture in a meaningful way. Uh, a relevant piece there is that it also means that we can use more specialized tools for each individual service that are better suited to meet the needs of what that service is trying to accomplish. Right? Uh, on the flip side, if we just have somebody trying to be this everything to everybody, uh, you very quickly end up with this like intertangled mass of just madness where like you know one thing goes wrong and I don't know, I have to dig for the next three weeks to figure out what broke, right? <laughs> uh, and that's just really not fun or exciting for anybody. Uh, as I mentioned, you can use the right tool for the right job uh, by doing this kind of approach. Uh, so, you know, for for us, um, for a long time, our kind of approach for this is, uh, you know, language-wise, uh, we would default to Python. And if we need something to be fast, we would do it in Go. Uh, starting to change a little bit, be a little bit more lean towards Go. But anyway, uh, or similarly, like uh, we have some search systems built on Java because they're taking advantage of Lucene's a really big deal, right? Uh, similarly, database-wise, we can you know, we basically, for better and worse, use almost all the open source databases, right? So if we have something that's just keeping track of like a small amount of real-time data, then we use Redis, because that's really well suited for that, right? Uh, on the other hand, for the system that like basically caches the results of all our, our crawling stuff, we're basically keeping a bit of metadata about every web page we've ever seen, uh, React is really helpful for that, because you know, if we try to put that in Redis, that's a lot of memory that we don't really want to pay for. Um, it doesn't really need to be in memory, right? So you can kind of suit things for how it goes. Similarly, you could do the same kind of thing with hardware, right? So uh, there certainly are advantages to having a relatively homogenous hardware stack. But in practice, different systems have different needs, right? So if you have a system where you really do need all the memory, right? You can just have a few really big, beefy boxes for that system and then have everything else run on much smaller, cheaper commodity hardware, right? Um, Similarly, you can make different trade-offs when it comes to availability, right? So for us, the thing that does shortening and redirecting, that has to be up all the time, no matter what. As we were joking earlier, if the redirecting thing goes down, we kind of just broke a non-trivial portion of the internet. We try not to do that. <laughs> Accordingly, that system has had a huge investments made in keeping it redundant and available no matter what. On the other hand, some of our more research systems where we're doing, let's say, maybe content analysis, that breaks for an hour, eh, whatever. We're not happy about it. We're going to work on it. But it's OK. We don't necessarily have to make as much of an investment in building as much complexity, keeping it highly available, which again helps us be flexible and manage cost. Uh, and one of the last kind of nice things about this, relating back to kind of those independent failure components, is since each service is completely isolated from each other and only communicates over HTTP and queues, it means that failure ha looks, ha has a different profile than it would in a monolithic app, right? If a system fails at Bitly, just that functionality breaks, right? It is extremely rare that all of Bitly goes down. The only situation where that really happens is when our data center gets knocked off the face of the planet, which is its own class of problem. Uh, even then, there's kind of ways to deal with that. Um, and even then, technically, everything's up. You just can't talk to it. Anyway, um, right? So, but so now your, your major failure modes all just look like a loss of functionality instead of a complete shutdown, right? It looks like a blackout in a few neighborhoods as opposed to, let's say, the entire Northeast power grid, right? <laughs> um, so, and degraded is almost always better than failed, right? Uh, the next major way that we kind of deal with fun distributed systems things is, generally speaking, prefer async over sync, except when it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Uh, so let's get into that a little bit. So what do I mean when I say async versus sync? What I mean is designing systems so that communication between either systems or even components within a system look more like sending letters to the mail or email than two people having a conversation, right? I'm just going to send off something and then trust that you got it, and then we'll do whatever you got to do with it, as opposed to you know, saying something to you and waiting for a response, right? Um, and what do we get from this? One of the biggest things you get is better isolation, right? So once things become asynchronous, 
it becomes super easy to basically introduce queuing or buffering between uh, senders and receivers. Accordingly, if the downstream systems fail, you can just buffer stuff up and it's OK. And they come back and go along. Additionally, uh, since there's not any kind of response, I'm just saying this thing happened. And then assuming you're dealing with it, I don't really have to care what you're doing with it. I don't have to care what your response to my action is. So it allows systems to just be designed to do what they do, advertise what they know, and then not have to care about anything else, which is really critical from a design and maintenance standpoint. Uh, looser coupling, right? So that kind of ties into that, right? Again, if I'm just publishing things that are going on and something else is picking that up, there's no tight coupling between those two. The only thing holding them together is the messages. And even then, it's only the parts of the messages that the two systems care about. There can potentially be other stuff going on in there that other systems care about and they don't, or things that can go away and that they'll be fine. Um, and this all adds up to being a lot more flexible, right? So by being async, you can kind of mm, play a bit more fast and loose in different places where it doesn't matter that you're more rich, right? But let's you move quickly. Um, additionally, you can do stuff like uh, easily fork things, right? So we've done things, we actually have done this twice now with a particular system, where we're changing out the database backend for something, right? Let's say whatever reason the, the database backend we originally built the service on, doesn't meet our needs anymore, we need to do switch out to something else, what we can do is have all the rights going to that system be in a, uh, asynchronous queue, um, fork it off, so we have basically rights going into two systems, when we have, when we stand up the new system, just pause that channel so messages pile up, do a backup of the old system, restore into the new one through whatever process we gotta do with that, and then unpause things and let it flow through, and now we have two systems that are basically running master master, and then at that point, we can just switch over reads however we want. And then whenever we're done, switch over the reads to the new one and kill the old one. So we just did a completely seamless database migration. Uh, and everything's happy, right? And there's lots of kind of tools you become available by doing things in this asynchronous message passing manner. Uh, kind of as I alluded to earlier, it's a lot easier to deal with errors and load issues, right? So let's say you get a big burst of traffic and something goes on. Uh, depending on assuming that you're working this way, that's OK, right? Things just pile up for a bit. And then when that burst subsides, you work through that backlog, and then everything will be fine. Uh, similarly, if, let's say, you know, uh, there's a bad RAM chip in a server somewhere, and every so often it's just randomly flipping bits, that server's going to be doing all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Uh, so what can happen then is if you have a bunch of things just consuming off a queue, that will likely just result in that reading less, and the message is going everywhere else, routing around the failure. Um, right, because if you're doing it asynchronously, it's okay to just retry and not have the upstream system get disrupted by that problem, right? The queue might back up a bit, but the upstream system isn't going to be disrupted. So where does this get hard? Uh, one of the main places this gets hard is consistency, right? Um, since uh, we're just firing off things, we're basically doing fire and forget, right? We're just saying, hey, this happened, and letting somebody else deal with it downstream. We don't know that it actually got dealt with downstream or how it got dealt with downstream, right? So if we care about that, that becomes hard. Um, additionally, you start getting into some of the fun things around that whole ordering problem. If you care, strong, care about strong ordering, this is one of those places where that comes up. Um, almost by definition, these things are passing between physical hosts, so time gets complicated. <laughs> um, so as a practical example, I can and talk through kind of how this ends up working out for us, right? So this is the Bentley web page. Actually, this is the old web page. Wow, I've rocked out to update that. We, had, we just got a new marketing page. So anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, the part you care about is the shortened bar at the top, right? Somebody puts in a link, and they shorten it, and uh, they get a short link back. Um, that entire process, from an architectural standpoint, happens completely synchronously, right? So from the front end, sending it to you know their internal services, to the service that's like their uh, thing that generates the hashes and is the uh, store of record for the short links to the long link mappings and, and back up, that's completely synchronous for two reasons. A, we really care about latency there, right? Generally speaking, if that was an async thing where like somebody had to hand it off and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, it tends to be slow or it can be more variable, if nothing else. Um, additionally, when we're giving out those short links, we much rather return an error than to return a short link incorrectly, right? Or not return nothing at all, right? We rather try and shorten something and have it fail and give you an error and say, hey, we're having some issues, come back later, than to just have you shorten and either have nothing happen, or even worse, like give multiple people back the same hash, right? Like that's like, you're crossing the streams, something horrible has just happened, right? Um, universe ending consequences. <laughs> uh, so we try not to do that. 
On the other hand, metrics incrementing and counting is completely asynchronous, right? When somebody clicks on a bit.ly link, right, we handle that HTTP request, we do the lookup to figure out what the long URL is, send them the uh, redirect response. Um, and then after we've sent the response back to the user, we'll put something on a queue saying, hey, this click happened, right? And the reason we do that is a, like our metric system being down should never impact redirects, ever, right? Again, breaking the internet, try not to do that. Um, additionally, you know, with metrics, while we try and keep things timely and as close to real time as possible, if people's click metrics get delayed by a few minutes, even up to an hour, it's not the end of the world, right? Like, if the system is having issues and we just need to back up stuff for a while, it's much better that we, A, don't disrupt the redirect process, and B, uh, have delayed data than bad data or lost data, right? So this gives us tools for dealing with that. Uh, next kind of technique that we deal with and I've talked a, bit, a little bit about is doing ev that events are better than commands, right? So when you're thinking about doing things in, in a message passing kind of way, there are different semantics that you can use to describe those communications and ways that you frame how you think about it and the way you design those messages. And usually it boils down to either events or commands, right? So with an event, you're basically just saying, this is a thing that happened, right? And information about the thing that happened. With a command, you're saying, go do this, right? I'm telling you to go do something. It probably is because something happened, but it's being explicit about what you should do about it, you being another system, right? And again, much like the whole async versus sync thing, by structuring it this way, you get much better isolation because, again, you, you're, you're getting better separation concerns, right? So the event producer uh, or the message producer with events doesn't have to know anything about what anybody else is going to do with it. Uh, while if it's giving commands, it has to know what the other system is doing because it's telling it what to do. Um, right? Each system lives in blissful ignorance of each other, right? They can just keep on humming along and doing what they do. If somebody else starts doing something in response to it, that's fine. Don't care. Not my problem. Similarly, if some system falls off the face of the planet and stops doing something in response to my events, it's okay. <laughs> don't know. Don't care. Um, and one of the particular operational things that becomes really nice there uh, related to that is you can add and remove consumers of uh, messages without any other larger system changes, right? So let's say, actually we do this fairly frequently, where we want to uh, pr provide our customers with some new kind of analytics or new kind of metric. Usually means we need some new system observing our uh, click data, right? So what that does is, the way that works is we build the new system excuse me, internally we call it uh, clicks decodes, right? So we just have a decode stream, and that new system just gets another copy of that decode stream. And it doesn't need, no upstream system has to know or care that this other system is consuming it. Let's say we try and launch that new system and decide that, oh, well, that was actually a really bad idea. That just isn't useful or it's too expensive or whatever. We decide to kill it. Again, we can just take that out, stop making that copy. Nothing upstream needs to know or care. It uh, doesn't get impacted, doesn't have an additional load. Uh, it's really important. Uh, as I also talked about before, you can change out implementation, right? It gives another benefit of that isolation is you can completely change out implementations without other systems knowing, right? If you are giving very explicit commands, especially as you get into more complicated systems, when you're giving commands, you're likely to be having, having to have some frame of reference for the internal details of that system to have commands that make sense. Um, when you're based on events, that information is completely contained within the consuming system. Therefore, if you change out the implementation, that change still just happens inside that system and nothing else needs to know or care. Um, a related note that we found, uh, there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, annotations are better than filters, right? Uh, so the example for this for us is, uh, so the way our system ends up looking internally is, um, you know, we have that decode stream, just like they're all, hey, these are click events that happened and whatever we captured off the HTTP request, right? And then we basically have this cascade of streams of basically providing additional information, like whether or not the click was on a private uh, bit link or not, whether uh, we think the click was an actual human versus a computer doing a thing, or uh, the topic of the page that was there, right? These are each, like, systems that consume the decode stream, add some information, produce new s information. Uh, originally, that privacy, that uh, privacy flag one was actually a filter. It would actually just 
uh, drop any messages that were not on public bit links, and then only produce a new stream that's only the public bit links. And what we end up running into is, as we would change various downstream systems, they would change how they want to handle the public-private difference, and they couldn't really do it because this decision was made upstream to just remove the messages, and they didn't have the private messages to deal with anymore and to make a decision about. So by doing an annotation, you're basically providing additional information without making assumptions about what downstream systems are going to do with it. The exception to this is sometimes filtering is necessary just to reduce the load on downstream systems, right? If you're doing something where, if you have a system where it might only care about 1% of your stream, uh, for us that means going from, I think, something on the order of 3,000 messages a second to uh, 30, right? That's a pretty big difference. <laughs> Um, so potentially you can, it can make sense, but as a preference, annotations do a lot better. Um, next kind of thing that we have is ways that we go about dealing with failure, right? And a lot of it comes down to figuring out how to have our systems play nice with each other, right? To uh, adjust the way they interact with each other based on feedback so as to both better handle failure and allow other systems to recover from failure better. One of the biggest mechanisms we have for this is building in mechanisms to allow for back pressure, right? So what this usually takes the form of is retries and back off, right? So like I said, all of our systems communicate over queues and um, HTTP requests, right? So for those request things, right? Like, like I said, sometimes we have to do things synchronously. For those request focused things, we'll also always build it so that you know, it'll try to make the request. And if it fails, it will retry, but it'll hold on for a second. It'll say, like, hey, does that work? No. All right. I'm going to wait a second. Hey, are you ready now? Nope. All right. I'm going to wait two seconds. Hey, are you ready now? Nope. We'll wait four seconds, right? And having that back off, A, so those two parts are both really important, right? So the retries lets you potentially ride around failure, right? Because you maybe retry to another host in the same cluster or something like that. Uh, additionally, you know, again, once you get to a certain scale, things just happen, right? Like, so somebody walks past the network, the switch, and you know, it blipped out for a second and dropped some packets. Happens. Um, so the retries let you just deal with the it happens the noise, uh, and then the back off is really important in that that gets into the playing nice, right? So there, uh, let's say you have a system where. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, like one of the, pr the primary, let's say you actually have a system where you have a, a master database node, right? And that just falls off the face of the planet. Um, and it switches over to the slave, and the slave gets promoted to master. Uh, and everything's OK, but all of its caches are cold, right? So if it just gets the full stream of, of uh, requests, potentially, that just falls over because it can't keep up with everything because the caches are cold, right? Uh, so by doing back off, where let's, what it does is it basically lets systems have some breathing room, right? So it's one of those things where like, hey, you seem to be having some issues. I'm going to like sh take some pressure off from you for a while. Like, I'm just going to not ask you so much for a little bit. Hope that that lets you get your stuff together, and then we'll try again in a little bit. And then when you seem to be doing better, we'll, we'll give you some more, right? Um, and you know, the thing to keep in mind with all this is none of these approaches will like, make it so your systems never fail, right? Uh, obviously, at some point, whatever's causing, right, whatever caused that master node to fail, you're still going to have to deal with. You're still going to have to deal with that master node. But these things all basically buy you time, right? It can move something from a, oh, we're in trouble, to like, oh, we got to do that kind of place. It moves it from somebody has to wake up at 4 AM to deal with this now to, oh, we can deal with that in the morning, right? Uh, which is almost <laughs> always a better place. 4 AM is almost never a good time to do anything other than sleep, uh, at least related to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so instead of smashing things to a pulp, back off and, and take some pressure off the downstream system. Uh, the last piece there, and I alluded to it a little bit, is look for ways to route around failure, right? So we have two main ways that we do this. Um, one of those is, so all this message passing and queuing and whatnot that I'm talking about, uh, we have a tool that we use for that that we've built in open source called NSQ. Uh, it's a real-time messaging framework. I'm happy to talk about it. It's cool. Uh, kind of looks like uh, Kafka, but a bit different. Fits in the same kind of place in your architecture. One of the things that's nice that's built into NSQ 
is it effectively will automatically route around failures, right? So let's say you have eight servers consuming off a stream, and uh, one of them starts having some issues, the real logic on that one that's having issues will automatically basically say, hey, I can't handle as much messages. And as a side effect, the messages will end up getting sent out to the other uh, consumers. Similarly, for request-driven stuff, we have a library that's been open source called HostPool. I think we have implementations for Python and Go. Um, and the way that works is you can kind of think of that as like an in-app load balancer, right? So what the way HostPool works is when you go to make the request, so you, as part of our like process startup, right, we'll tell HostPool, here's all the servers you could possibly uh, ask this question to, right? And so when we're ready to make the request, say, hey, HostPool, give me a host. And it'll give you a host. You make your request, and then when you get the response, you either say that request succeeded or failed. And based on that, in memory in the process, host pool will basically adjust the probability of giving out that host again in the future, right? So you combine with this with, with retries, what ends up happening is it'll pull uh, server out of the pool, you'll make a request, it fails, it reduces the probability of uh, sending that out again. You retry, send it to some other server, you have routed around the failure, um, the neat thing that comes as a side effect of that, though, is they'll still every so often send a request to the bad host. And this way, whenever that host gets taken care of, it can just get pulled back into rotation, right? So then you basically have a self-healing system, right? So either if there was some innovation that happened, or let's say, you know, again, somebody just walked by the rack and just kind of gave the server a hard elbow, right? The, ser the hard drives are probably like, whoa, what's going on? We just need to stop the world, right? Like, things are going to get weird for a few seconds, but then everything will be fine, right? And you just need to be able to route around that. Uh, you might want to deal with the fact that you have people throwing elbows in your data center, but another issue. Um, yeah, so that's what we got there. Uh, and the last major piece uh, that we, we really try and think about with everything uh, around distributed systems is monitoring. Uh, this guy is Leslie Lamport. He's kind of one of the big thinkers and kind of one of the main people or earlier thinkers in distributed systems. It has this fantastic quote of, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer useless or unusable, right? Uh, that's a hell of a thing, <laughs> right? Um, so this is actually a picture from inside our primary data center. This is a portion of the servers that run Bitly. Uh, which one's the problem, right? Even if you, so there's, there's a few layers to monitoring, right? And it basically comes down to listening and understanding. Um, right? So there's a first level of A, do you know something's broken? When you have 400 servers, it's really easy for something to be broken and you don't know about it. <laughs> or similarly, when you have six years worth of code and functionality, there almost certainly are parts of your app that you don't use every day and could be broken for months and you don't realize it if you're not actively checking. Um, so A, you need something to do that checking. For us, that's mostly Nagios. Um, but then once you know something's broken, now you have to figure out why it's broken and how it's broken, right? Uh, and so again, for us, the particular tools that we use are Munin and Graphite. Uh, so Munin basically just does like general, like you plop it down on a system, it collects a bunch of like general health metrics like uh, CPU use, load, memory use, disk I.O., right? Just like every minute or whatever, just gathers all those metrics, sends it off to a central server and gives you some nice pretty graphs so you can just Go and look on, scan down a page, and go, oh, that desk, disk just stopped accepting writes. That's probably a thing, right? Um, so that's super useful. Graphite is basically uh, a tool for collecting and dealing with time series database, strictly speaking, StatsD and Graphite. Uh, StatsD is kind of the collection end, Graphite is the database and visualization end. Uh, so we use this for basically any kind of custom internal metrics, right? So we have all kinds of metrics like our, the, basically on all those queues, we keep track of like the message uh, success and failure rates and the retry rates, all that gets visualized. Uh, increasingly, we're looking for just general overall, overall system health kind of stuff. So like uh, we recently introduced checks for, so through Bitly you can post to Twitter and Facebook, right? And at our scale, like, there should just be, like, if that goes under a certain threshold for a certain period of time, something's probably wrong, right? Uh, so we've increasingly had these kind of threshold alerts of just like, hey, if this goes over or under this number, let somebody know because there's probably something up. Um, something we've learned with that is like, A, when you introduce a new alert, uh, it is likely you will find something that's been broken for some time. <laughs> just because when you haven't been watching something, eh, it's probably broke. 
Um, but additionally, we also get to the fun place of like, uh, when there were those Facebook outages uh, a month or two ago, uh, we noticed. <laughs> Set off a whole lot of alarms. And unfortunately, it's one of those things you can't do much about in that case. Um, but at least you, you, you know that something happened, which is kind of like, you know, uh, accepting that the problem, there is a problem is the first step in addressing a problem, right? <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, with that, that's most of what I got. Uh, so wrap things up. Distributed systems are awesome. If you got a large amount of data to deal with, you probably want them. But they are hard, right? You got some challenges to deal with. So remember that knowledge is power and understanding the intrinsic characteristics of those systems will help you design and build them in ways to take advantage of those and deal with those appropriately. Uh, and in return, we'll give you cheap, fast, scalable systems. Uh, and real quick before I finish up, a quick shameless plug. Uh, so Bitly, we're hiring uh, pretty much all of the things. Uh, we're primarily based in New York and Denver, uh, but we got some fun problems to deal with, as hopefully you saw in this, and uh, Peter and I would always be happy to talk about that. Uh, and with that, thank you. <laughs>